when it comes to fintech specifically, it gets a lot more complicated because a lot of people just don't wanna think about it, right? Having a little bit more autonomy is always a good thing, but I think we have often just kind of swept it under the rug when it comes to fintech responsibility because there's a lot we don't understand. I think that that has become like a really big part of my understanding of fintech. It's just asking the questions about regulation and do you actually want to work with regulators? Do you actually want to look out for the consumer? Or are you just saying that because you feel like you have to? Hi everyone, it's Julie Verhage Greenberg here with your Tux Time podcast from Fintech Today, where we talk about all things fintech. And in this episode, I am joined by Kinsey Grant, co-founder and host of Thinking is Cool, a podcast that dives into some tough topics and asks hard questions, many of which end up involving fintech at times too. So Kinsey, I am so excited to have you on today. Thank you so much for having me, Julie. I'm so thrilled to be here. I'm a big fan of your work and fintech today and fintech in general. So it's an honor and a privilege. Right back at you. So before you started Thinking is Cool, about like six months ago, give or take, how much did you use fintech? Did you know much about it? Like, tell me sort of like where you were coming into this from. Definitely a perfunctory kind of knowledge. It was essentially what I needed to get by to cover the space, right? So when you're a reporter, you kind of have to, as you know, become a subject matter expert in a lot of little areas all the time. And especially with what I was doing in my previous job, I was interviewing a lot of people. So I had to know what I was going to ask them about, know what I wanted to talk about. And often that did involve fintech. But as a user myself, that was not really something that was a huge part of my life or my story. I now have gotten to understand the fintech space a lot more and have a lot more appreciation for it as a reporter and as a customer as well. But at first, not a ton of knowledge except for kind of the big takeaways, like the basics of what you needed to know to get by to ask smart questions was essentially what I had for fintech and for a lot of other other areas as well. (laughs) But um, I would say fintech is one that I I certainly had a lot to learn uh, and hopefully have made good on the effort to learn more about this space as I've matured in in my career and in uh, my coverage of finance and business and the economy in general. So as you dove into this topic, like what has surprised you about the space? Like as you started using some of the products in here, as you did your research to interview different people, what were some of the things that you're like, oh, wow, I had no idea stuff like this was going on? Because I'm going to assume you knew about things like Apple Pay and Venmo and whatnot, but That's just like scratching the surface. Yeah, it definitely is. I think that is probably the biggest learning is that there was just a fintech solution for just about any problem that you could think of, or at least a purported solution for any problem you could think of. And one of the the big things that continues to kind of amaze me is just how many players there are in the fintech space broadly. There are so many startups and and even the institutional interest too, right? Like when you combine all of these newcomers with more traditional players in the field, there's just so many people who are trying to make good on this space. And I think it, it shows promise, right? It shows that there is something here. Um, fintech is obviously a trend that has existed in some form or another for a very long time, and it's no longer a trend, right? This is part of the economy. This is a, a tried and true sector now. And I think that the fact that we have so much interest flowing into this space has really shown me that this is something we're going to get a lot more comfortable with. Um, I think one of the more encouraging kind of new revelations that I've had since I've started spending a little more time in the fintech space is just how incredible it is that education is a big part of the fintech story. When you talk about really any fintech newcomer, especially Education is a huge part of their strategy and not just in a marketing sense in, uh, you know, we don't even care if you use our product. We just want you to understand what, I don't know, buy now, pay later is. We just want you to understand what it means to invest in real estate, right? Like these new ideas that a lot of people, especially young people, didn't know were a possibility for them are now being made very obviously a possibility, which I think is really cool and and something I appreciate about the space that uh, is not necessarily something you would expect from the more traditional finance sector. It would be very out of pocket for like Goldman Sachs to come out and be like, this is exactly how our investment banking arm works. And this is how M&A works. But that's what you get in the fintech space, which I really appreciate. Yeah. And it's funny you say that because there it's a fairly recent phenomenon. Like I feel like some areas like the robo advisors were always pretty good about having blog posts about like, here's why you should invest for the long term and you shouldn't like try to time the market, blah, blah, blah. But 
even like, so Robinhood is one of those companies that you've asked the hard questions on. And while they're starting to get a bit better about that, like it was very much not part of their strategy before, right? Like they just essentially, they make more money, the more that you trade. So they want you to trade as much as possible, which often isn't the best strategy for a retail investor. So I find it fascinating that, that that's been the perspective over the past year, because I feel like you know, you you did start learning about fintech right as that was sort of taking off. Yeah, I definitely did. I mean, to, <laughs> I was trying to explain to somebody literally yesterday about what payment for order flow is. And I was like, this is something I didn't know, right? Like six months ago, I never would have wanted to have an in-depth conversation about the ways that brokerage platforms make money. Right? And now this is a part of the story that I'm trying to tell when you talk about platform responsibility. It's not just Mark Zuckerberg. It's also the CEO of Public and Robinhood and like TD, all of these companies, they have responsibility. And now I think we're starting to recognize that a little bit more. And I think it's it's good that people are learning. You know, we might not have the perfect definition for what all of these pretty intricate financial tools and technologies are, but at least we have some sort of a working knowledge or you have the ability to create some sort of a working knowledge with essentially the internet at your fingertips. I think that's that's really cool and something I admire, but uh, it's still a lot to, to figure out. And I think we're only now kind of scratching the surface in terms of holding these platforms more responsible or at least expecting more of them. This is a relatively new development in consumer technology more broadly, regardless of what kind of technology you're talking about. We didn't always care. Like this is a new development, a new phenomenon. And so I think there remains to be seen a lot, you know, in terms of like what we expect and, and what our standards are, what our values are on the internet. But at least now we have the ability to develop those standards and values. Yeah. So what are some of these, I mentioned the hard questions that you're asking about fintech. What, what do you think the hard uh, questions are that we need to be asking ourselves both as, you know, as me as a founder in this space, but also as people either working at these companies or using the apps and platforms that fintech is making available? I think it's just communication. I remember one of my first interviews in my old podcast, I interviewed uh, John Stein from Betterment. And he kind of blew my mind with the very simple knowledge. Like now everybody says this all the time, but at the time it blew my mind that if it's a free product, you're the product. And I was like, wait, what? Exactly. Like you're right. But how come I had never thought about that? And I've used all these free products for so long and I just never really given it a second thought. And ever since he said those words to me as the CEO of a free product, right? Like that is, is, always in the back of my mind with every interview that I go into when you're talking to the leader of a company, you have to keep that in mind. What are you getting out of this with your relationship with me, the user, that I'm not getting out as the user? You know, we have to have some semblance of equality when it comes to what each of us is walking away with at the end of the day. At least that's our hope now. But I think when it comes to fintech specifically, it gets a lot more complicated because a lot of people just don't want to think about it, right? Like, I don't want to think about the way that my money works all the time. I want to use my debit card and hope that the money is in the account. Like, I think that is the attitude that a lot of people bring into their financial lives. It's not necessarily the right attitude, at least it's not for me, like having a little bit more autonomy is always a good thing, but I think we have often just kind of swept it under the rug when it comes to fintech responsibility because there's a lot we don't understand. Like you start to say FDIC and everybody's eyes glaze over. Of course, of course they would, the average consumer, but that's important. That's an important part of the fintech story and of the consumer tech story too. You know, these institutions are in place for a reason, hopefully to protect the consumer and to ensure that the consumer gets the most out of this relationship and not necessarily just the company or the corporate entity with which you're working. Um, and I think that that has become like a really big part of my understanding of fintech is just asking the questions about regulation and expecting the answer to always be, we welcome regulation, but I want to, I want more, right? Like I want to dig deeper. I want to understand why you welcome regulation and what you're doing. That's specifically like anti-Facebook. That's always the example that I use. Mm -hmm. Facebook pays a ton of money to run ads that say we welcome regulation. We want to work with legislators, but their actions speak a lot more loudly than their words do, at least their words in advertising. And so I always try to take that uh, approach to understanding what they actually mean. Like, do you actually want to work with regulators? Do you actually want to look out for the consumer? Or are you just saying that because you feel like you have to? So as you dove into fintech, what types of products did you use before you started to learn more about it? Like, did you bank at a traditional bank or did you use a challenger bank beforehand? And which ones are you 
using now that you've really enjoyed, um, you know, getting to know more and putting your money in? Yeah. So I was very much a traditional bank user <laughs> for most of my early adult life. Um, I was like a Bank of America user. So like super classic. Um, and I got a Bank of America account because that was the only bank branch in my college town. So when I was opening my own account for the first time, I wanted to be able to go into the branch and like well, that is crazy to think about it's now. Ama- that the reason I switched banks. So I was a PNC bank person when I was in high school, since I was in Michigan and that's a big like Midwest bank. And then I moved to New York and I'm like, wait, the only PNC branch right now is in Jersey. I can't do that. So I'm going to have to switch banks. Where like the concept of having to switch banks based yeah. on where branches is so weird now. It really, really is weird. And it, that wasn't that long ago. <laughs> like it, it really was not that long ago that we were thinking like this. Um, and my sister, she's a couple years older than I am. She still thinks like that. She's moving to New York. She's like, there's no SunTrust in New York. I'm like, there's no <laughs> SunTrust, period. <laughs> but you know, I, I got to, to understand what else was out there a little bit more the older that I got. And especially working uh, at a startup, I think that really opened my eyes to what the other options were. Um, because you kind of get ingrained in that startup culture. Uh, I also got weirdly into like the PayPal world when I, my first job out of college, I was covering a lot of tech companies um, and ended up like, I don't know, getting buddy, buddy with some people at PayPal and they have a lot of really cool products, you know? So I, I started to understand a little bit more what their growth trajectory looked like. And I think that getting that, that kind of baseline understanding of this is a company that I understand, right? Like this is a company that I have been familiar with for a long time. Um, PayPal in its most basic form, FinTech, but one of the like old school kind of FinTech companies been around for a while, something my parents feel comfortable using, but to see that they had all of these different lines of, of growth lined up, right? Like different revenue models, different revenue streams, tech that they were acquiring that was something I was prepared to start using all the time. Um, I thought that was really cool. And it, it showed me that this isn't just about like the startup world. It's not just the, the PayPal mafia, right? Like it, it can be the PayPals of the world too. Um, and I think that really was was kind of like a, a seminal moment in understanding what comes next for some of these companies that have been around for a really long time. Because in my position, when I was working for, you know, I was working for the street, I was essentially writing for like old white dudes who wanted to invest their money, right? So like they wanted to know what these big companies- I forgot that you used to work at the street. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I did. So, I mean, I was writing for people who didn't know what like Klarna was, but they definitely knew what Bank of America was. And so you had to make the connection to, to ensure people that like the future will come eventually and it will bring new products or bring new ideas that you're not used to, but here's how you can get used to them. Uh, and going through that process myself was really helpful in figuring out how to cover all of it. Um, but in terms of the, the tech that I use today, obviously Venmo all the time. <laughs> um, and then like starting to, to get into some of the sub Venmo tools. So like Splitwise is a big one that my friends are big on. Um, and like things that make splitting things a lot easier when you go on like a big trip together or something like that. Um, I obviously got very familiar with HM Bradley working with them for the first season of my podcast uh, and started to understand a little bit more of the intricacies behind the whole concept of we are not a bank, which is something you hear all the time in fintech, but not something I necessarily understood until I started to read a little bit more of the footnotes in, in all of their, uh, copy and, and communications. Um, but then I also am a big fan of the fintech solutions for like actual investing and, and trading. So like the Fundrise, the public, I am a public user. I love public. Um, and I, I find those to be created a little bit more with the user in mind, which I really appreciate. And my mom and dad use, I think they use Fidelity and I have looked at their accounts, right? And like, essentially we're getting the same thing out of this experience, no fee trading, whatever. But it's just so different. Like mine feels so much more natural to me. And I think it's because a lot of these more like fintech uh, competitors are created a little bit more with the user like me in mind, which I genuinely appreciate um, and enjoy the the more like social aspects of it and investing on theme and um, sharing what you're doing with your money with people, I think is like kind of a crazy phenomenon. That's really, really cool that you can just talk to people about investing and it's not taboo and it's not weird and you get to learn new information and learn about new companies. Um, so those are, are just some of the uh, new fintech tools that I have been into in my, my post Bank of America days. <laughs> <laughs> One thing you didn't mention though is crypto. Have you, I know you did a podcast that was focused on crypto. Have you dabbled in it at all? Like what are your thoughts there? Yeah. So I have dabbled. Dabbled is definitely the word. Um, for a long time, in all honesty, I mean, and, and you know, the, the kind of like 
traditional school of journalism thought is that you're not allowed to invest in anything. Um, and when I worked at the street, I was barred from investing in anything other than the street stock or putting money in my 401k. Um, and that was like kind of something that haunted me for a while. I didn't really feel comfortable investing my own money after I left that kind of old school journalism world for quite a while. Uh, and so by the time I did feel comfortable <laughs> investing my own money, um, I was a little late in the crypto game, which is unfortunate because I started covering it well before the like $20,000 in 2017. Like that was the big mm -hmm. story that got everybody interested um, or it got the, the mainstream folks interested. And if only I had bought when I started covering, I had it would be a different same, story. I had the same issue. So Bloomberg, obviously, like you can't buy crypto companies, anything outside of your 401k or an ETF. So I remember, I think the first story I did on Bitcoin, it was like $300 or something like that. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, if I would have put like, even just, just like known. $500 in there, it'd be worth yeah. so much more now. I'd still be working, but it'd be worth so much more. Exactly, now. exactly. And my mom always gets at me because my mom is big into crypto now. She's like a power Gemini <laughs> user, which I think is hilarious. She's obsessed with Gemini. Um, but she wanted to invest when I started covering it because she hadn't heard of it, right? And she was obviously reading all of my stories and um, wanted to invest in crypto. And be, I think because I was surrounded by so many institutional voices, because I was covering stories that were aimed at institutional investors, I was like, I don't know, the risk portfolio, I just like, it doesn't seem right for you right now. I was like 22 <laughs> years old saying this. I should have been like, bye, 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 you know? Um, but my risk tolerance was not particularly high then. Uh, so I told her, obviously make your own decision, do your own research. I'm not going to. And that is like the story she loves to tell now <laughs> because now she has crypto. She's like, if only I had bought in 2017, this would have been a different story. And she gets all like fired up about it all the time. But oh, that's um, too funny. I, I like invest in crypto here and there. I wouldn't say it's a huge part of my investment thesis right now. Yeah. That's so funny. It's the same as me. Cause I remember um, my mom was like, you know, I just got like X amount of thousand dollars in inheritance from your grandma and I'm looking to put it towards a little something like, should I do crypto? And I was like, no, I don't think you should do crypto. It's really risky. But you should, I, my saving grace is that I told her to do real estate and real estate has performed yeah. really well too. Not as well, but it's, it's done okay. So. Right, it has. And, and perhaps a little <laughs> bit more uh, indication that it will continue to do okay. Yeah, yeah. At or at least be crypto. stable. Yeah, yeah. Totally. Uh, so I guess what areas of fintech most excite you right now? Like when, when you're, you're starting a new season fairly soon, uh, what are going to be some of the big questions that you're going to want to be asking to people in our space? I'm really, really excited about an episode that I'm working on right now uh, that's going to be about the role that uh, kind of like speculative trading has played in replacing gambling. Um, so the idea that when we remove all of these barriers to put our money into something, uh, sometimes you remove barriers that might potentially be necessary. And when you are not armed with the right information, and we talked about this just a minute ago, you know, when the Robin Hoods of the world are making money, the more that you trade, they're going to encourage you to trade. Uh, and that is not always a, a smart decision. And I want to really dig into this idea that we have replaced uh, the, the high that we might get with something like gambling or, or sports betting with investing today. Uh, I think a lot of young people have done that. And I want to explore the ways that platforms have had some responsibility in that. You know, we talk about the the publics, the Robin Hoods of the world, what they've done to mitigate the fallout of this, because like, I don't know. It, to me, it seems inevitable that there will be fallout down the road. Um, and you know, we we had the whole Wall Street bets mania in uh, the early, like early pandemic uh, months. And you know, I spoke with Jamie Rogozinski from Wall Street Bets when that all was kind of going down. And essentially, there's like very little in terms of of taking responsibility, which it's it's not his responsibility to tell people what to do with their money, right? As the the moderator of a Reddit thread. But I think that it encouraged me to kind of dig deeper into like, okay, well, where does the buck stop? Who does responsibility fall on? If we as individuals cannot be trusted to uh, make the right decisions for ourselves because we are so addicted to that like dopamine rush of like a, a half a percentage point gain, right? That is, that's a high to us. So uh, I want to explore that and I'm, I'm really excited to do it. I think it marries a lot of really interesting aspects of my coverage as it has existed so far. When you talk about accountability of like CEOs and leaders and corporate leaders, um, but also the idea that we are addicted to technology in a way that sometimes is really great, sometimes is beneficial, but also 
also sometimes can be our downfall. So I'm excited to uh, to figure that one out. <laughs> a lot to unpack in one podcast episode, but I am hopeful that I will figure it out. You can always do two. It's acceptable. Yeah. You just yeah. do like a part two to that. So if people want to check out that podcast and others, how do they find you guys? So the show is called Thinking is Cool. It is available on uh, any podcasting platform. We are just about anywhere. Um, I also write a newsletter that goes with it. So you just go to thinkingiscool.com um, and sign up there. And I'm all over social media too. Kinsey Grant, you can find me pretty much anywhere. <laughs> There we go. And if you want to learn more about FinTech Today or check out any of our other episodes or our newsletter, go to fintechtoday.co. Otherwise, thank you, Kinsey. This was so much fun. We need to have you back on again to see how your second season goes. Yes, I would love that. Thank you so much for having me, Julie.